Um, Micah chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. Do not preach. Thus, they preach. One should not preach of such things. Disgrace will not overtake us. Should this be said, O house of Jacob, has the Lord grown impatient? Are these his deeds? Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? But lately, my people have risen up as an enemy. You strip the rich, robe from those who pass by trustingly, with no thought of war. The women of my people you drive out from their delightful houses. From their young children you take away my splendour forever. Arise and go, for this is no place to rest, because of uncleanness that destroys with a grievous destruction. If a man should go about and utter wind and lies, saying, I will preach to you of wine and strong drink. He would be the better preacher for this people. Catherine, thank you very much. And very good to see everyone here today. I would like you to imagine, please, that we were one of those sort of bossy, enthusiastic churches. uh, The kind that make you sign up for big campaigns. So imagine on the way out that uh, we were going to make everyone, I don't know, dip your thumb in some ash or something or make your mark on a a big man-sized contract to promise that we will all give two colleagues a message from God on Wednesday. Okay, imagine we were going to make you do that. We will all give two colleagues a message from God on Wednesday. Well, we are not going to do that. You can calm down and relax, but imagine that. So you you line up and you, you take the pledge to swear to give two colleagues that message. And I wonder who you would choose. Uh, Would you choose your most friendly co-worker? Would you choose the most unintimidating person you've got at work? Or maybe your recently appointed boss. Yeah, that'd be a good idea, wouldn't it? So um, you book an appointment with uh, with Maurice Tullock and uh, you, you know, I'd like to see the CEO, please. I have a message from God for him. And uh, imagine his PA says, well, that that sounds important. Um, I can fit you in at 2 p.m. So 2 p.m. on Wednesday, um, you know, and she turns to, to, to the boss, you know, Jill from Stationery has a message from God for you. Uh, 2 p.m., you go along. How do you feel about that meeting? Well, doesn't how you feel depend entirely on what the message is? Which is to say, doesn't it depend entirely on who your God is? That is going to be the big idea in Micah for the next four weeks. Micah's name means who is like the Lord. The the whole book is a a debate about what kind of God Israel's God is. And uh, what we're going to do, we're going to take four verses from the book over four weeks. And there is some good news for your two o'clock with the CEO tomorrow. Look down at 2 verse 11, because Micah knows exactly what people want to hear at work. So look down at 2 verse 11. Here is exactly the right kind of preacher for this people. Here is what he would say. I will preach to you of wine and strong drink. That's the message. Sorry about the accent. Uh, In other words, the message from God is... God wants you to have another drink. Uh, Mr. Tullock, God says you deserve a glass of champagne. Look at the uh, EPS figures. God says the next round is on him. That's the message. Point one on the handout, the perfect preacher with the message everyone wants to hear. Doesn't that change how you would feel about the, um, the thumbprint pledge on the way out of church? Guess you would be much more willing to go and find two colleagues and give them the message from God tomorrow. If the message was, have another drink, um, I certainly would feel very much more willing. And certainly, once the, um, the word got around the office, that the, the office Christian group, all they want to do is tell you to have another drink. Um, I think that would change, wouldn't it? How they'd feel about your events and your flyering in the lobby and your carol services. See, how you feel about speaking for God 
depends on what the message is. And that depends on who God is. And the, the context around 2 verse 11, what we'll do each week, we'll take one verse and then we'll look at the context around it. The context around 2 verse 11 is an argument between Micah and all the other preachers in Jerusalem about what the message is. You can see that in 2 verse 6. Um, Catherine read it very well for us. Micah has started his book with two or three messages from God. And then the, um, the local preachers, they give some constructive criticism about Micah. Um, here we go, verse 6. Do not preach. There's some, some firm feedback. Thus they preach. One should not preach of such things. Disgrace will not overtake us. You see, Micah's message up to this point has included or even has been largely negative. He's told them that disgrace is going to overtake them. Uh, but all the other preachers, they have a positive message. So Micah, don't preach that. Verse 7, God is not like that. And Micah's reply is 2 verse 11. Um, it is quite rude I think. He's saying, well, do you know who would be the perfect preacher for you? Do you know the, the best preacher for the city of London, the best preacher for anybody with that kind of attitude? His name is Father Jack, the best preacher. I appreciate not everyone here will have been born in time to watch Father Ted originally on TV, but I assume most of you know who I mean. Um, the, the preacher you'd really appreciate, let me introduce, and in staggers Father Jack. Uh, the old Irish priest shouting, drink. And Micah is being rude, but just like Father Ted, actually, the satire is not far from the truth. Um, Frank Kelly, the, the actor who played Father Jack, he died quite recently, sadly, but uh, the year before his death, he was interviewed on Irish TV, and he said that right across Ireland, people would come up to him and say, how did you know? How did you know about our Father Jack in our village? In other words, in church after church after church, there was someone who matched his exaggerated character. The priest you could have a drink with, who propped up the bar and made sure that you knew that God wanted you to have another drink, uh, as long as you bought one for him as well. And it, I don't think it's different here in the city. In, in our denomination here, I went to a dinner at the Guildhall not very long ago, and I, I sat with another vicar either side of an experienced city official. And um, she had a surprising evening, and it was written all over her face. She could, it was very odd. And, and after kind of the main course, and I said, what, what's wrong? Why do you look so shocked? And she explained that it was uh, the first time she had sat with a vicar at a dinner and got all the way through the main course without them being drunk. And up to that point, neither of us were. But the issue here, actually, it's not about being drunk versus being teetotal or things like that. It is about what God is like. And it's about whether believers should say what God is like. Whether the people who carry messages from God should speak them in full or edit them until they are acceptable. And I think that is where this verse has an entirely contemporary feel for us here in the city. So could your God ask you to carry a message about disgrace? And would you pass it on if he did? How bad would things need to be in our world before God would be allowed to say that he was not happy? with all of it. Well, here's a more challenging way of asking it for me. Um, if we asked the non-Christian people who know me best to describe my God, what would they say? Um, what would they say he was like? What is the message to them that I've passed on to them over the years? Now, Micah had to think about all of this because of a crisis that he lived through. And that's what makes this book very useful to us because um, we can look in the historical record and know that Micah was right 
about every single thing he said. There's no ambiguity here. The passing of time has made that clear. So we can do some hard thinking about God and God's message that comes out of the the kind of crisis where you cannot hide behind half-truths. And we're we're not going to be able to go into detail about the history during this series, but um, I'd say it's worth reading up on uh, if you're interested in that at all. Micah lives through a, a moment in history that would feel like Stalingrad to Russia or feel like D-Day to France. And in 1 verse 1, he gives us his dates. And the the map you've got here on the handout gives us just a little bit of what is happening. Here's the executive summary. Um, When Micah starts his preaching career as a young man, the kingdom of Israel has two capital cities split into two halves And both of them are big and successful. You can see Samaria and Jerusalem on your map if your eyesight is very good. But you should also see on the map, slightly easier, a load of big arrows coming out out of Assyria. This map is all about how Assyria conquered the world. And every date on the map is the date when a capital city was besieged and a kingdom was conquered. And uh, we're in uh, BC dating, so as time goes on, the numbers get smaller, and you can track their progress across the map. When Micah starts preaching, Assyria is just some big power far away to the north that maybe we're a bit nervous about. But 10 years later, they conquer Damascus, 732 BC. That's a bit of a shock. And 10 years later, 722 BC, they conquer the northern half of Israel, And they took everyone from Samaria away as slaves and refugees. And then 20 years later, 701 BC, the worst happens. And Assyria invades Micah's country. And he conquers, they conquer all the towns of Judah one by one. And they besiege Jerusalem, the city of God. And if you really want to do your homework properly, you should go to the British Museum, where they have a whole room full of six-foot-high carved stone pictures of the Assyrians doing this in 701 BC, carved by the conquerors at the time. And Micah's book comes in three sections, and each time he begins by asking, please will somebody listen to me? You can see that in 2 verse 2. Hear, you peoples, all of you, pay attention, O earth and all that is in it. And each section fits a new period of time in the crisis. And this week, we are in the period when Micah's predictions sound totally crazy. So Micah stands up and says, 1 verse 6, Samaria is going to be destroyed. That is like saying today that Argentina is going to invade New York and destroy it. What a crazy thing to say before the Assyrians even have a border with Israel. Then, verses 10 to 16 of chapter 1, he says all of the minor towns of Judah are going to be conquered. It's like saying that uh, Hungary is going to conquer Dorking and Basildon and Basingstoke. Um, can, Can you see why Micah is having this argument with all the other preachers? We are 35 years away from the siege of Jerusalem. We're 13 years before the invasion of uh, Samaria. Damascus is still holding out. And Micah comes and says things like chapter one, death and nakedness and shame and lamentation and disaster and conquest in Dorking and Basildon and London. Don't say that. Say what everyone wants to hear. And They say out loud what we, I think, sometimes do here explicitly, but certainly this is what we read on people's faces, isn't it? What we assume that they're thinking. Just look in verse 6, verse 7 of chapter 2, and do you see how thoroughly they deconstruct Micah's preaching? And again, how contemporary this is. 2 verse 6, you should not preach of such things. You should not. In other words, it is immoral, it's wrong to say things like that. It's a kind of thought crime. It is offensive. Don't do it. Uh, The rest of 2 verse 6, disgrace will not overtake us. In other words, you're just lying. 
And no way will God allow Samaria and Jerusalem to be attacked. That is just obviously false, fear-mongering, exaggeration, lies. 2 verse 7. Has the Lord grown impatient? Are these his deeds? Um, In other words, you are wrong about God. Um, the, The people speaking here, they're not the secular thought police quite, this is the other preachers. This is the church down the road and the other Christians at work. They, they say, no, 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 Micah. Um, God doesn't get impatient. God doesn't get angry. Uh, he doesn't do things like destroying cities. God is nice and kind. God wants us to do well. Say that. And then one more thing in 2 verse 7. Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? which is to say, Micah, you are wrong about us. Uh, We are not the kind of people who need a message of judgment. We're the good people. We walk uprightly. We're the great and the good. In the city, we give to charity and get involved in social responsibility, and we're kind to our team, and we go to church every now and then even. Micah, you are immoral, lying, wrong about God and wrong about us. And I think, I hope you, same as me, get the impression it's that last one that really makes them cross. You are wrong about us. And 2 verse 11 is Micah's reply. If you can't cope with what I'm saying, then really the only kind of preacher you'll be happy with is the one who says, have another drink. Uh, Let's just do that. This week's sermon and next week's sermon until further notice is just, you know, whose turn is it at the bar? Uh, God wants you to have another drink. And it's nice that we have a diversity policy at work. It's nice that every religious and philosophical group is allowed to speak. It's nice that we have total freedom of speech here at Right On PLC, as long as the Christians only say, have another drink. Um, What I would love you to discuss over lunch, if you have time to stay for that, Discuss um, what are you allowed to say about God at work? And what what does our culture allow us to say? What do we allow ourselves to say? What do our churches and Christian friends allow us to say? And, of course, the, the right place to start with that conversation is what we normally do say. I, I was half term last week, I was away and met a lot of people I don't often meet and had several open conversations with people who would not call themselves Christians. And one man even asked me, what do you say to those people in the city? Now there is an open invitation. What is the message from God that I left him with? Was the message only positive? Or did it truthfully cover the good news and the bad? And we'll see that every section in Micah, it starts with bad news and then moves on to good news. That is the the normal Bible pattern throughout, from beginning to end. Starts with bad news, moves to good news. Micah's God has both things to say. Micah wants to tell us that rescue only comes after judgment or only comes through judgment and out the other side. Micah is a preacher like Jesus in that respect. There is no true Christian good news that doesn't talk about the bad news, that doesn't talk about judgment. There is no need for Jesus to die if God is the kind of God who just wants us to have another drink. And the the drunken clergyman at the city dinner Um, fitting in with everybody else. He is actually not a sad figure of fun like Father Jack. He is actually an expert. He is an expert in what our culture wants from its preachers. He has calibrated his message precisely for maximum impact. And actually, it may be that he is just more honest than me. Um, I think I put enormous effort into trying to live alongside my friends as if God is actually fine with everything in their life. Uh, In um, the days back when you had to actually go and meet people in pubs and talk to them rather than on email and on Facebook, um, 
we, I worked out, even as an 18-year-old intern in a, in a bank in the city, I worked out that one glass of whiskey had half as much alcohol in it as one pint of beer. But that all of my colleagues thought I was drinking more than them if I held a glass of whiskey rather than a pint of beer. So this was magic maths that worked very well for me um, and enabled me to tick the good Christian box and stay sober while giving the, everyone else the impression that God said, have another drink. Um, now, all of us have to work out our different way of approaching the, the Friday night drinks and whatever it is, but, uh, and you don't have to ruin every party that you ever get invited to. That's not the point. Um, but the danger I'd suggest for most of us is at the other end of the spectrum. The danger is that they say, do not preach, and they say God is not like that, and we say, oh, okay, um, great, I, I never really wanted to say any of that anyway. Now, I've got three minutes left just to dip into Micah's real preaching and show you how good it is. Uh, what Micah really has to say, it is not comfortable, but it is good. So the perfect preacher has the message everyone wants to hear, but Micah, point two, is a messenger who tells the truth. And let's pick that up in 2 verse 8. So the truth is that lately, God's people have not walked uprightly, whatever they think of themselves. In fact, they've been much more like highway robbers who specialize in mugging helpless refugees and specialize, verse 9, in making women and children homeless. And Micah, he has some news for them. And the news is that God can see you and that God cares about the helpless and the homeless. And that 2 verse 10 is an eviction notice. Arise and go. See, God is not always nice, but he is always loving, which is not the same thing. God loves the people that you're taking advantage of, he's saying. And God will be fair. I, I suspect that 2 verse 10 is written using the language that they used in their eviction notices when they uh, kicked out the women and the children. All God's going to do is, is give you what you've given to other people. Only the same. Only what is fair. 2 verses 1 to 5 give us more detail. Um, they devise wickedness and evil. And then verse 3, God devises disaster against them. And the, um, the joke is that the same word there means evil and disaster. You plan disaster for them? Well, God sees and God cares and God plans disaster for you. And that is the plain truth about God. And it is so good, isn't it? Um, good if you get angry about how you are mistreated at work. Good if you read about um, clergy who abuse children. Good if you worry that everything is getting worse and no one seems to care. Good if you think that this world is not fair. Um, there's much more to say than God is fair. Um, we, we really want to tell the CEO and our colleagues and the security guard and whoever, that God forgives bad people. That's the good news. God is fair, but he forgives bad people. You can escape God's judgment. That's where Micah is going. But we can only tell you about God's mercy if you will let us tell you about God's judgment. And most of us Christians have been silenced. And Micah is going to tell us how next week. So I guess um, you think you do have a message for God for all the people at work. But I guess uh, the way you feel about that is strongly related to what the message is. And to work out what the message is and should be, we've got to do hard thinking about our God and who he really is. Let me ask God for help with this. Our Father, we thank you for your consistency, your faithfulness, your truthfulness. 
Thank you, Father, for people like Micah and others through the whole Bible who tell us the truth about you, the bad news and the good news. Thank you for your wonderful good news that you have forgiven sinners against you, forgiven uh, those of us in this room who trusted you no matter what we've done. And pray, our Father, you would help us to speak the truth about you. In Jesus' name, amen.